So good morning. I said one of the miracles and silver linings of our era is that there is no such thing as a snow day. So it's so good to see you and uh, to study Torah together in this dorm. So let's thank God for the gift of learning Torah together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher bochar banu mikoha amim v'natam lanu et Torah to Baruch atah Adonai noten haTorah. So here's what I want to do today. Um, we have a different move of um, we have a different move from Isabel Wilkerson, a different kind of voice. Um, in the past, she's talked about the tremendous terror. I mean, we saw lynchings and public parties of lynchings. We've seen the eight pillars of caste that she's talked about. Today, she talks about uh, how caste intrudes itself into the lived lives of ordinary black Americans all the time. And she gives some of these stories, which I mentioned in the teaser, her own story of being stopped by government agents for no good reason when she was rushing from one city to another to an appointment. Uh, the father who's trying to get his kid to eat his vegetables and the kid wants to drink uh, a sugary juice and some nosy white woman butts in. Um, the, the, all, a thousand daily indignities that Black Americans feel, and her basic, uh, her basic principle is that, and, and that's why she had this business about the dog, they had the, the uh, alpha dog and the fake alpha dog and the underdog, that middle class, middle caste whites get very bent out of shape when they see a lower caste Black start to thrive. And a lot of this is acting out. That's her, her, her theory. So what I want to do today is, is talk about, get your reactions to her, to her piece about the intrusion of caste into everyday life. And then I want to offer you a perspective uh, from the Torah. And it's a miracle how it happens. It's on our weekly Torah reading this week. It's standing at Sinai. Uh, this is an insight from Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um, that was popularized by Shai Held in his book, The Heart of Torah. And I think it is just squarely on point with Isabel Wilkerson's analysis. So that's our move today. We're gonna to talk about her teaching on the intrusion of caste into everyday life. And then we'll look at that through the lens of Abraham Joshua Heschel's insight in the 10 commandments. So let me just begin by asking people for some uh, basic reactions. What did you think of this, these, these pages, these chapters on the intrusion of caste. Marilyn Kalis. Well, it, it really hit me when I heard um, a talk from Bali, Brandeis Lifetime Learning, Michael Bobbitt, who is uh, presently the, um, the, the director of- uh, Mass Cultural Council. Mass Cultural Council. And he talked about um, how it, the intrusion in everyday life, he has to think about what kind of a car he's going to buy because he doesn't want to be too flashy. When he goes to uh, be with some of the people in his uh, board of directors, he has to think of what he's wearing. He has to think about where he goes. He says if he, he wants to visit someplace up in Vermont, he goes on Google to see if there's been any anti-racial um, uh, movement there. So it, I, I was struck by everything that she said, but then when it came personally to somebody who was highly educated and culturally astute, it really hit me. And Marilyn, <laughs> um, forgive this question, but did you not know this before? Or was of this something you were awakening to? Yeah, no, I, I knew it before. You knew it before? Yes. And so is it is it hitting you in this season of your life differently? It is, because uh, it, there's so much of it now. And, um, you, you know, you, you see that these people have been struggling for so many years and made progress in the 60s and then lost it again. And Black Lives Matter much more now um, because this just seems to be so much more um, 
fright on the white from the white supremacists and the people who want to hold on to their life the way that it's been. And Marilyn, so you say that you, 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 you've kind of known this. Does Wilkerson's lens about caste offer you a new lens or a new insight? Do you feel like you have a deeper understanding of your country now or not? I have a deeper understanding, yes, I do. Um, but I, I, I did know most of what she is saying. It just says she, count, she words it in a different way. Mm. Okay, thank, thank you, Ren. Connie, your hand's up next, and then uh, Linda. Uh, Connie Geeser. Um, to me, the difference is that any one of these incidents could have erupted into violence. And that is what was frightening to me as I read that, as I read it. Before these incidents might have happened to her and there would not be that much involvement with people around, but it's scarier now. Right. And imagine I mean, here's one of the takeaways. I want to build on your word, kind of scarier. Imagine how hard your life is now. Imagine how hard it is to get through the day now. It's plenty hard to just get through the day in a decent way till the end of the day where you didn't break anything and you come home and you put in a decent day. That's very hard now and, it, and very hard before COVID. Imagine mm -hmm. that in addition to that, you had the X factor where any innocuous thing you're doing could turn out to be a life altering or life ending event. You're taking your grandchild out for dinner and some nosy neighbor butts in and calls the cops on you. Or you're running late for an appointment and somebody interrupts you or stops you or feels they have a claim on your time. And that's, um, you know, that is, and also what's different about this chapter, I mean, we are, those of us who have been following this, you know, I'm from Colorado and uh, the story of this young man, Elijah, who was a music therapist, uh, the gentlest soul. And he's just, he's just listening to music after he does some of his, um, massage therapy. He's walking home, bothering nobody. And some white woman calls the cops on him. And four cops come and they throw him down to the ground. And he's, you know, he's, he's frantic because he doesn't know what happens. And they, they shoot him up with this chemical and he dies. And then the, the white cops make a big joke of it and make it, and do all these photos of them uh, doing an arm hold around his neck. And um, that's on a given day. And that, that element of random scariness, that you're just kind of making it through your day and then some white bystander calls the cops on you or intrudes in your life. That, and she brought that up in this chapter in just some powerful ways. That's if, in, a, in addition to the indignities, like the neighbor comes over to welcome the new neighbor and they think that she's the, you know, the, from Holly Cleaners. So, Scary it, it is. Uh, Linda Leffert, your hand is up. I think what was different for me <clears throat> that she pointed out in, the, in her book <clears throat> is the, um, uh, the idea that the combination of more Black people accomplishing things, and especially since the 70s, a whole swath of white people um, not doing as well for all the reasons that we discussed <clears throat> makes them even more infuriated by Black people who seem to be accomplishing things. Mm. And um, so that aspect of it wasn't, you know, something that I, I really had in, in the equation. But um, my husband was in, in the Navy as a surgeon when in the, 19, um, in the 1960s. And, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn um, in a somewhat mixed neighborhood, mostly white. And I thought I was aware 
of what was going on. And Josh White came to perform in Jacksonville. And he wasn't allowed, he performed, but he wasn't allowed to sit at the bar and have a drink after his performance. And there was someone, one of the physicians who lived in Jacksonville permanently, and he invited Josh White and his young help, you know, associate to come to their house afterwards. And at that time, that was a shock to me. Mm. You know, I thought at least entertainers, you know, you're entertaining in this place. You can't sit down and have a drink. So that's probably changed, but then there's this whole other level, which in some ways is, is even worse because it's like you, you, he knew that was what was gonna happen and that's not good, but it's what he expected. But in these examples that she gave now, these people did not expect, you know, this young oh. woman going to a conference in DC that she'd gone to all those times certainly right. didn't it and i think that's worse so it's complicated and we've made progress in some ways but in some ways i think it's harder yeah what i hear you saying linda is you know that congress could legislate civil rights legislation which makes discrimination illegal but that does not stop discrimination mm -hmm. because in the end you can't legislate the human heart Mm -hmm. And and white human hearts that feel under siege or they're losing their place or things are eroding um, will find ways to try to assert dominant on the lower caste that they see, to use her, her terms, right? And that is beyond the realm of Congress to legislate. Because when the neighbor comes in, when the black woman comes in to welcome the neighbor, the new neighbor and the new neighbor says, oh, you're, you're from Holly Cleaners, let me get my dry cleaning. That <laughs> Congress can't touch that. That's just so deep. That's just so deep. Congress can't touch that. Um, and that's what we're left with. Um, did I, I, let me ask you the following question. Um, does anyone, first of all, I guess, apparently Isabel Wilkerson spoke yesterday. So if anyone heard her, would love to hear what she had to say and does anyone find in these dark chapters any hope or any seeds of hope? So anyone hear Isabel Wilkerson's speech yesterday and do you find in these chapters any hope? Dottie. Dottie, you're uh, gotta yeah. unmute. He said it's already open in these chapters. Dottie, you have to unmute, please. You're not unmuted, Dottie. You're still not unmuted. You're still not unmuted. Why don't you work on unmuting and then we'll take you and we can get you. Ah, now you're unmuted, okay. What bothers me about this book, it's, it's I was, I'm horrified. I, I think everybody basically knows the facts, but the fact is I think today it's even getting worse. What bothers me, I grew up in a town with one black Negro boy who was a neighbor. We were in from grammar school all the way up from first grade through high school. He was always in my homeroom because his last name began with a B and mine did. We never had a problem. We walked to school together. We'd go into the Woolworths. Nothing, it, this was like, say, in the 50s. When I read this, I think to myself, most of the things that she cites are in the South. And I know that's inbred because I spent a weekend with a couple from Mississippi and it turned my stomach. The things they said and the way they acted, I think it's taken many years for us as Northerners to say, and again, when I was first married, I lived in a town where there were, there were no Blacks. But even if there were this, this prejudice, this, I seems what happened from the Civil War of 165 years ago, did, didn't make any difference according to her because until Lyndon Johnson stopped Jim Crow, I was amazed and happy to read that whole segment about him. I can't understand how people with a heart or with feeling can act like this and do the things that she cites. It's 
it's beyond. Well, Dottie, I, I only want to respectfully and lovingly push back on one point. In no way, in no way does the South have a monopoly on prejudice. Oh in no God. way. Um, when you think about the fact that just in Waltham last week or two weeks ago, you know, a black man was run over by a white man who was yelling a racial epithet. That in, oh that's five miles from where you live oh two weeks ago in 2021 and killed him. He's, and he's a father of three kids. Um, that was in New England. That was in Belmont. Right. And crazy. then when you think about, you know, her Forrest Whitaker story, this guy is an Academy Award winner. He's going to a deli on the upper west side of New York, Manhattan. That's pretty blue city in a pretty blue state. And, and he's frisked publicly because he comes in and goes out. I mean, I, I remember, you know, my great teacher and, and, and my great role model, Rabbi Chill, who was in Malvern, New York. And Rabbi Chill once told me that, you know, the South gets all the press for racism, but nobody is more racist than Jews in New York. And that's true. That's true. Um, and, and, she, and she actually quotes, she quotes, I mean, um, uh, Isabel Wilkerson quotes, I think to Tocqueville. She quotes to Tocqueville who said in the 1830s that he found this anomaly that the places where there were no blacks in the North was the greatest racism against blacks. That's in her book. So I, I, all of which is to say, we don't need to do an Olympic competition on who's more racist, but I do think, you know, we Northerners uh, might be uh, inclined to say, oh, it's a Southern thing, it's an Alabama thing, it's a Mississippi thing, and it's a human thing, and it's a white thing, and it's an American thing. And I don't think we have the luxury. Of, so that, that's the only thing I just want to push back on. I think we all have, uh, all have work to do. Um, I want to ask if anyone um, heard Isabel Wilkerson's talk yesterday, and if anyone has any uh, seeds of hope from this chapter, and then I want to give you at least a seed of insight, if not a hope, from our Torah portion. Anyone? Uh, uh, Paul? Mm. And you have to unmute, please. Paul, if you can unmute, please. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, I have a great deal of hope. Uh, after reading this book. The mere fact that it was published gives me hope. And then on top of that, the fact that it has become a bestseller indicates that a lot of people are interested in finding out what is happening in their own country. And what is it that has been happening that they didn't realize? That a lot of things that were sort of blurred are now coming into focus. And uh, I think, I think the, I don't know who buys the book, but I assume the majority of people who, who buy the book are not black because the blacks already know what's, what's happened. So I have to think that there's a certain raising of consciousness because this book has been so successful. Well, from your mouth to God's ears, Paul. Maddie Donna. Yes, I had the privilege of hearing um, Isabel Wilkerson yesterday being interviewed by Don Lemon. And um, there, I came away with what she said at the end. What I found different about this book from many of the books that we've been reading by other black authors, there's no anger. There's no uh, fire in her about um, being, it, there's no vindictiveness in her. Uh, she tells the facts, she tells what's happened. But what she says at the end of this interview, I thought was very revealing. She said her book is not an argument, but it's a prayer for our country and that we need to make repairs to our country uh, of what we've inherited, but we can't repair what we cannot see. And I thought that that was absolutely uh, spot on to the message throughout the whole book. And uh, that uh, she really has hope that there will be changes. Hmm. Maddie, what do you, as a reader of the book, what do you now see that you did not see before you read the book? I think I didn't see um, the, I, I think I knew exact, I, I think I knew what black people were dealing with on a more blatant, open, what's in the news way. 
but I don't think that I understood the more subtle, um, the, um, the unconscious bias. I think that this really showed me more about unconscious uh, bias and that, uh, that the, problem, um, the problem can't be fixed overnight. It's, it's the, the numbers that she calculated, the number of years it will take um, before that generation uh, is alive longer than the, than the number of years that people were in slavery. In slavery. Those numbers were astonishing to me. Because you talked about the racial bias. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, and, and, the, and the, the explanation of racial bias in such uh, ways that we never, Bruce and I never even considered. Mm. Wow. Okay. Charlene Finkel and then Fran Feldman. So oh, I think it's wonderful to read a book and learn about things uh, that maybe we knew or didn't know. But I think we have to start with ourselves and look at ourselves. Uh, are we free from prejudice? No, I don't think any of us would go and slam uh, a black person in a car. But without us realizing it, are we doing things? So, you know, it's so easy to castigate somebody else. H how do we react when we see a black person? Do we have any black friends? Uh, so I, I think this book was very good to make people aware, but I think the awareness has to begin in our own soul. Charlene, thank you for that. I want to just, um, building on that for a second, tell you something that you know that we talked about last week, but I want to concretize it and urge you and, and plead with you to do something. Uh, next Tuesday night, which is um, February 9th, next Tuesday, February 9th at 6.30, we're starting this dialogue with the Mass at, with the Western Avenue Baptist Church. And you know, one of the things that we do very well here at the temple is white Jews talking to white Jews about racism and about the experience of black lives. But what we don't do, because I think what you said, Charlene, is true. Many of us don't really know that many black people. Um, and so we read about, but we don't talk to, and we don't hear from. So uh, yesterday, you know, I was on the phone with Jeremy Battle, and what we talked about is he's got a group of, uh, I mean, there's going to be far more whites than blacks in this class, because, you know, we, we already have something like 120 people registered, and his whole church is, is about that size. Um, so, uh, but he has about, he has somewhere between 15 to 20 super accomplished uh, facilitators. And what we're gonna do, he, he's gonna queue up an issue uh, of the book, and then we're gonna be put into breakout rooms that are gonna be as diverse as possible with white and black and Christian and Jew and synagogue and church. And the facilitators of all of these uh, breakout rooms will be members of his church. So there'll be a black facilitator talking to a hopefully diverse group about the issues raised in this book. And, and that's really where the rubber will hit the road on this. And then we'll go back to Jeremy at the end. It's a one hour thing from 6.30 to 7.30. So here's what I want to say. This is really hard work. I mean, it would be hard work if there were no COVID. It would be hard work because it's just hard work to get out of our comfort zone. And it's hard work to try to make new black friends when you've never really had a history of having black friends. And all of that is much harder when it's COVID and all you can do is look at a screen. But I think your point, Charlene, is so well taken and it's very important work and it's very holy work. So I hope you will join me. It's a bit of an experiment. It could not work, it could not, it could not succeed, but the aspiration is a good aspiration which is actually not just to talk to each other about black experience, but to talk to blacks and hear from them and learn from them their own testimony. And not just by Isabel Wilkerson, who's this great writer, but the, the lived lives of ordinary citizens who live in greater Boston. So um, Jeremy is gonna be sending us a teaser. I'll be sending that out to you. 
and asking people to register. I would love it, especially this group, because we've been studying this book, you know, since the new year. Uh, I would love you guys to give us an hour from next Tuesday from 6.30 to 7.30. Join this group because it will do exactly, Charlene, what you're talking about, which is try to build relationship and dialogue uh, with, with, um, with Black citizens who have such so much to teach us about their, their world. Um, Fran Feldman. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm already signed up for next Tuesday, but um, I just wanted to, two things gave, well, one thing gave me a great deal of hope in the book, and that was the description of what happened during the Great War when the Africans, uh, African-American soldiers came into France so that they were treated as equals by the French mm. until uh, the white you know, army people got so incensed at the fact that the blacks were being treated as equals that they stopped the, um, they stopped that kind of behavior. The same exact thing happened in England during the buildup to D-Day when there were, uh, it was a, the American army basically took over the South of England and took over, had so many soldiers there and the British acted toward the um, African-American soldiers, the Americans, just as if they were white, just as, as if they, without color, without any distinction of color. The British women would dance with the African-American soldiers, the British uh, townspeople interacted with them as if there were no difference in color. Until again, the army clamped down and there were riots when some uh, white American soldiers uh, got incensed that the black soldiers were being treated equally uh, as, as um, by the British. So I think we have grown up in America in a caste system. And I think the fact that she brings that to light in so many different ways, I've, I've always thought of sociology as a study of things we always knew, but never really understood completely and weren't really in our consciousness. So she has raised our consciousness about this. And we can see that there are other ways of reacting to people of color. And unfortunately, we're straitjacketed by this caste system. And that's something that I think we have to work to overcome in this country. It doesn't exist everywhere. So right. there's hope for us. I think that's her signal contribution. I, I, just speaking for myself, I did not know that we had a caste system until I read caste. I didn't know. And, and now that, that I read, you know, I'm reading the book, I'm like, oh my God, I never saw this. And how could I never have seen this? And that's the work we have to do. Okay, I want to pivot to the Torah. So I sent you um, the Ten Commandments. And I want to frame this. Uh, and again, there's nothing that I'm telling you that is mine. Uh, no inside of this did I come up with. Uh, it's from Abraham Joshua Heschel. And it was communicated uh, more popularly by Shai Held in his book, Heart of Torah. But what I want to do is apply Abraham Joshua Heschel's insight to this world of the intrusion of caste. Here's the question we're trying to solve. It's always good to know what question you're trying to solve. Why do white people go bananas when blacks prosper? That's the question. Why do blacks go, why do whites go bananas? Why do whites go crazy when blacks prosper? And that seems to be the through line of American history. From the end of the Civil War, you get Reconstruction and then you get Jim Crow and so on and so forth. Uh, you have President Obama and then you have President Trump, right? You just have this back and forth of progress and then the opposite or of um, counter-reformation. And, and she identifies it, the psychological roots of it as uh, white people who are kind of in the mid-level uh, caste uh, don't like it when lower caste, i.e. blacks are thriving because it makes them feel bad about themselves and their eroding place. And the question is, so the question we're trying to solve is, what is that? Why is that? What, what's the psychology? What's the human element of a mid-level caste person feeling threatened by somebody who's lower caste? Um, and that's where the Ten Commandments comes in. That's the question we're trying to solve. So this is where Rabbi Heschel points, OK? Uh, Rabbi Heschel asked the following question, which is, what is the relationship between the first commandment of the 10 commandments 
and the tenth commandment. What's the relationship between the first commandment and the tenth commandment? So the first commandment is God spoke all these words saying, I, the Lord, am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. Right? This I'm the God of history, and I took you out of Egypt. Anochi Adonai Elohecha, I am the Lord your God. Asher Hotzeiticha, I took you out. Asher Hotzeiticha, me Eretz Mitzrayim, I took you out of Egypt, me Beit Avadim, from the house of bondage. So the first command, and there's a whole separate sermon in this, and there's a whole separate class in this, and there's a whole separate life struggle in this. I think it's fair to say that the first command is to believe in God which is a whole separate conundrum, right? And, it may, and it's an even tougher one because the God they're supposed to believe in is, uh, is not the God of, oh, wow, the mountains are so beautiful and the sky is so blue and the, the snow is so beautiful. It's not the God of wonder. It's the God of history. I took you out of Egypt, right? So the first command is believe in the God of history. That's a tough one because obviously instantly you say, but the Holocaust or instantly, but you say, look at Jewish history or instantly you say the Crusades or instantly you say Darfur or instantly you say, oh, what about the plague? What about the pandemic? What about all the thousands of people who have died of COVID? What about, where's the God of history there? So it's not an easy thing to do, but that's the first command. Believe in the God of history. Put that to the side. We'll, we'll put a pin in that. I just want to acknowledge it's a very challenging to somewhat impossible command, that first command. But that's what it is. Okay. Now, then Heschel says, take a look at the 10th command. Okay. So now move to page 448, verse 14. The 10th command. You shall not covet your neighbor's house you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female slave or his ox or his ass or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, the 10th commandment is hard in a different way. The first command is really hard because what do you mean I have to believe in God? I don't want to believe in God. And what do you mean I have to believe in the God of history? What about the Holocaust? But you have to believe in the God of history. That's the first command. Tenth command is, is hard in a different way. The, the Torah seems to be commanding my heart. The Torah seems to be commanding my heart. And it tells me, don't fall into the comparison trap. Don't fall into the comparison trap. Don't compare yourself to your neighbor. There's always somebody richer than you. There's always somebody thinner than you. There's always somebody who's got more grandchildren than you have. There's always somebody who's got more nachas from their children than you have. There's always somebody who's healthier than you are. There's always somebody who's handsomer than you are. There's always somebody who takes cooler vacations than you take. There's always somebody who has a nicer home and a nicer second home and a nicer third home than you have. There's always somebody who has more than, is more than, than you. No matter who you are, where you are, there's somebody who's got more than you have. And the 10th command is don't fall into the comparison trap, right? The 10th command speaks to you. And then it says to you, don't think about your neighbor. Your neighbor's deal is not your concern. You shall not cover your neighbor's house or anything else your neighbor has. Don't be worried about the nachas that your neighbor gets from their children and grandchildren, not your hunt. Or as Andy Stanley says, there is no win in comparison. There is no win in comparison. So, but that's also hard because you're human and, and that's one of the things we humans do. We compare ourselves to other people. Uh, one of our colleagues on this uh, class, Paul Greenberg, sent me a piece from the Israeli scholar Dan Ariely, who writes, uh, or who does this video piece about 
people are okay so long as they're not in last place. And the, the, the question that Dan Ariely, this Israeli guy, asks is, why is it that Americans often vote against their economic self-interest? Why is it that Americans who are schlepping along are opposed to an increase in the minimum wage? And his answer is, because it's just human, I don't, you know, I, I don't love where I am, but I get a lot of nachos from the fact and a lot of consolation from the fact that somebody's worse than me. So long as I'm not in last place, I'm okay, which is the comparison trap, right? That's human. So here's Heschel's question. You have these two impossible commandments, believe in the God of history and don't envy, even though most of us have a real hard time believing in the God of history and it's just human nature to envy, okay? Now, here's Heschel's question. What is the relationship between these two impossible commands? And here's Heschel's answer, and I just love this, okay? And this is the point where I think it intersects with Isabel Wilkerson and the intrusion of caste. Abraham Joshua Heschel says, the first command is about God liberates us from the external pharaoh, external oppression, right? We're not building brick pyramids in the hot Egyptian sun with the taskmaster. God liberates us from the external pharaoh. That's the first command. So that we can liberate ourselves from the internal pharaoh, namely us. We have met pharaoh and it is the man or the woman in the mirror. It is us. God liberates us in the first command from external political oppression so that we can liberate ourselves from our own internal pharaoh. I want to be more. I want to have more. I want to do more. I want to be more. I want more. I want more. I want more. My neighbor has more. And until that I can control that voice, I'm still in Egypt. And worse yet, the pharaoh is me. And so Heschel's read is that the Ten Commandments gives us lifelong work to liberate ourselves from the comparison trap. Because when you're stuck in the comparison trap, you go crazy. Now, I think that there is a lot of resonance of Heschel's scheme to Wilkerson's book. Because it feels like what's going on is there are a lot of poor whites and struggling whites that are in the comparison trap. And when they see a black person who's you know, thriving and succeeding and driving a nice car and has a, fun, a, a wonderful position, let's say they see a black person who becomes president of the United States, it makes them go nuts. Just read strangers in their own land. When people in, in rural Louisiana who voted for Trump, you know, by landslide proportions, talked about what it was like for them when Obama became president, right? He's cutting in line. There's just, it's just this comparison of they're stuck in the 10th commandment. They are, they are envying their neighbor in a way that drives them bananas. So I think that if we are gonna be liberated politically from social unrest, the key to that is figuring out how American citizens can liberate themselves from their own internal pharaoh. Thoughts, comments, and questions. Uh, Linda. My mother, may she rest in peace, had her answer to that. And that was, don't envy anyone else because you don't know among other things not just because it's not good you never know everything about that other person you may think they have it all and it's not true my first job after college was at a brokerage firm and i worked for one of the partners helping him and having my own clients and he lived in Scarsdale, he had a tennis court and more amazing, when they finished a, a match, they got rid of the ball, tennis balls. I mean, to me, that was like the utmost luxury. Come to find out that his family, 
several of the people had cystic fibrosis. His family founded the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And when I moved to Boston and for a while was getting the New York Times and the Globe, I read the obituary for his brother's five-year-old daughter who died of cystic fibrosis. And I never forgot it. I never forgot what, what she said and how, how wise it was. Thank you, Linda. So this is tough work and it's ongoing, but Heschel's insight, which I think connects with Israel Wilkerson, is that we don't get, is, is that political tranquility of our common society hinges on the tranquility of individual hearts of citizens who live in our society. And that's daunting. Um, I wanna give you guys a, uh, I wanna give you a very nice film to watch that Shira and I saw Saturday night. Shira has these roommates from college, five women and Shira, and every Saturday night she, is in dialogue with her roommates. And, and they all talk about, you know, because we, we've all seen every Netflix series that there is to see. And now in month 11 of the pandemic, does anyone have any new movies? And I'm always grateful because every Saturday night, it's like, what are we gonna watch? And there's nothing to watch. But Saturday night, we got this recommendation from one of her roommates called The Last Picture Show. The Last Picture Show was a film made in 1971. And it purports to be about a Texas town from the 1950s. So it was made in 1971, but it purports to be about the 1950s. And it's about a town, uh, all white people, the economics are bleak. The town really has no particular reason to exist. It has no economy, not, doesn't produce anything. And it talks about the relationships between high school seniors and the adults in their lives. And there's just so much brokenness. And I was watching this movie. Uh, it's a slow start, but hang in there. It picks up. I was watching this movie like this because it dawned on me that we basically made, at one level, we've made no progress in our country because it's towns like this that elected President Trump president in 2016. He would go to towns like this and say, you're not seen, you're forgotten, only I can fix this. And those towns put him in the White House. And, 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 and what's so shocking about it is that that wasn't a new problem in 2016. This film was made in 1971 and it was about America in the 1950s. So basically in 70 years, and it's about, by the way, to again, put it in cast terms, these are mid-level cast people. These are white people who are struggling. Or if you were to use the language of today, this is the place where Angus and Dean would report high depths of despair. If you're a white person growing up in Texas with no economy and no way out. This is where drugs and alcohol and suicide shorten your life. Uh, and and what's, what was so sobering about this movie, the last picture show, is that it's, it just seems to be an intractable dilemma. It's 70 year old problem. So if you wanna see what's at stake, in, uh, and, and what our country has to deal with. Like, how do you get Americans to be good with their lives? How does the 10th commandment ever get even close to being fulfilled if, you know, gestured at even? Uh, you have to see this movie because it shows you the challenge for, for real, real Americans. I mean, we, we are so, the 1% of the 1% of the 1% of the 1% living in Newton, Massachusetts. Our world is just so unrepresentative of the rest of the country. 
we're, we're in a bubble within a bubble within a bubble within a bubble within a bubble. And it's easy to just, by the way, I love our bubble, but, but it's not the rest of the country. So any last, uh, but, but if you, by the way, there's a storm and if you're stuck, watch the last picture show, it will take your breath away, but it's heartbreaking. How do you get to it? Comcast. You just shout into your little machine, the last picture show. Yes, John. Uh, I saw many smiles on the screens because those of us who are older than you remember it when it came out <laughs> and it was a major movie. And uh, so we, we already know about it, but I'm glad you've seen it. I think one other thing that has not been said is people whose lives are desperate need someone to blame for their situation. And that's what our past president was great at, saying not only no one cared for you, but it's their fault. Right. That, that's a major problem that, uh, uh, that's part of this. Mm. Yeah, she talks about scapegoating. And that's, you know, and that's one of the powerful points of comparison between the black experience here and the Jewish experience in Germany is we're both scapegoated. It was our fault. We were the stab in the back. We were the reason why Germany lost the First World War. Scapegoated. And uh, that, that, that goes along with it. So, okay, so your homework is for this uh, next week. Um, please read the next 50 pages. Please sign up for next Tuesday night at 6.30 and um, be open to an experiment that we're running. We've not done this before. I hope it works. There's no guarantee. But if it's a failure, it's a nobly intended failure. And let's go in with open minds and make it work. And, um, and if you haven't seen Last Picture Show uh, and you're looking for a movie to watch, it's a great film. So great, but true. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Stay safe. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>